A man wearing many hats, the billionaire owner of a major U.S. basketball team and the co-founder of Chinese tech giant Alibaba. A report sheds light on how he's linked to China. Food and medicine are in short supply under Shanghai's lockdown. Millions of residents are still stuck at home, but some are starting to speak out. What is life like inside a Xinjiang labor camp? A former detainee tells his story. TikTok's ad revenue is primed to surpass Twitter's and Snapchat's combined. Most of that money comes from the United States, but many still say the video sharing app spells danger for Americans. And for those watching our full episode, inflation is hitting the U.S. hard. But it's not just an American issue. Wallets around the world are feeling the pain, and people across Asia see the problem on their dining tables. Welcome to China in Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. The billionaire owner of the Brooklyn Nets basketball team is making headlines. That's for investing in technology that helps Beijing track its Uyghur population. The information comes from a report by ESPN. The U.S. as the Chinese Communist Party is committing genocide against Uyghurs, subjecting them to slave labor, mass detention, and forced sterilization. Uyghurs make up an ethnic minority in China. They're mostly Muslims and live in China's western Xinjiang region. The billionaire Zhou Cai found success in U.S. sports. He owns basketball teams like the Brooklyn Nets, the New York Liberty, and the San Diego Seals of the National Lacrosse League. Cai also holds stake in the Los Angeles Football Club. But Cai is not American. He was born in Taiwan, went to law school at Yale, and has Canadian and Hong Kong passports. Back in China, he's the co-founder of tech giant Alibaba. The company is like China's Amazon and is one of the world's biggest online commerce companies. Zhou Cai is Alibaba's executive vice chairman. The ESPN report says while he was overseeing the company's investments, Alibaba funded two Chinese companies that built technology for Beijing, used to track the Uyghurs in Xinjiang. Those two companies are MagV and SenseTime, top artificial intelligence developers in China. A New York Times report says Chinese authorities use their facial recognition technology to track and control Uyghurs in Xinjiang. In 2019, the U.S. blacklisted the two companies, banning Americans from investing in them. The Treasury Department says they added Beijing's human rights abuses in Xinjiang, including mass detention and using high-tech surveillance against Uyghurs. Alibaba has a 30 percent share in MegV and 7 percent in SenseTime. On top of investing in surveillance technology, the ESPN report also touched on past controversy that Tsai got involved in. That's when a tweet put the NBA at odds with Beijing. Houston Rockets manager Daryl Morey wrote the post in question. With it, he shared an image that says, fight for freedom, stand with Hong Kong. At the time, protests in Hong Kong were in full swing. Residents were standing up against Beijing's tightening grip on the city's democracy and freedom. Morey's tweet angered Beijing. The NBA lost its Chinese sponsors, while streaming services stopped broadcasting its games. That tweet ended up costing the NBA $400 million. As for Zhou Tsai, he was on the board of NBA China when that storm erupted. The NBA reportedly had high hopes for Tsai, saying that he would be invaluable in the league's efforts to grow the game in China and other global markets. Tsai later wrote a long post on Facebook trying to explain, quote, why the Daryl Morey tweet is so damaging to the relationship with our fans in China. He described Hong Kong's pro-democracy protesters as separatists, the same term used by Beijing state-controlled media. That's despite most of the Hong Kong protesters making it clear that they weren't looking to become independent. Tsai's Facebook post drew backlash in the United States, with critics calling him a shill for the Chinese regime. Tsai declined to comment on the ESPN article. Lockdown restrictions in China's largest city are easing, but at least 15 million people in Shanghai remain confined to their homes. Those residents continue to struggle to get food and medicine. Next, let's hear from three of them about what life is like there.
We are willing to cooperate with the country, but we also hope that our life can be respected. This is Grape Chen, and that comment comes more than 20 days into her lockdown in Shanghai. What she's most worried about right now? Getting her father much-needed medication after he suffered a stroke last year. Once he gets into a vegetative state or starts suffering from Alzheimer's disease, his life expectancy will be shortened by the degradation in quality of life. Doctors warn Chen that's what would happen without the medicine. Her father could suffer a second stroke, which could lead him into a vegetative state or even death. We cannot accept this result. But her local community representatives dismissed her concerns. The community workers don't have this difficulty. They may think that as long as the person is alive, it doesn't matter if he is in a vegetative state or suffers from Alzheimer's disease. For Chen, as well as other Shanghai residents living under lockdown, food and medicine are scarce, with supplies off limits after delivery workers and other essential services went under quarantine. Every day, Chen would spend five to six hours frantically calling emergency hotlines, including the police. But a representative told her there was nothing they could do and that even the police department was locked down. After making dozens more calls, she finally found one hospital that was willing to fill her father's prescription. By Wednesday, two of his three medicines had arrived, though her father is still running out of one of them. Contrary to Chen's frustration, another Shanghai resident says she's feeling fortunate. Overall, I feel my life in quarantine is ideal. That's Liu Yafei describing her fifth quarantine experience since the pandemic began. Her community and company managed to send her enough food and supplies. She counts herself among the lucky ones. But this state should not be difficult to achieve. Rather, every person living in a city that is able to function normally should be able to have such a life. However, I realize that not everyone is like me. When I read the negative information online, I feel very sad. While one Japanese national in Shanghai appears to be among the less fortunate. I wondered if it would be impossible for me to get any food. Yasuki Hayani has been under lockdown since April 1st. What was supposed to be a five-day lockdown for him has now extended into a 13-day lockdown and counting. But if there was a positive case on the 13th day, based on current rules, we'd need to be under lockdown for another 14 days. So you really wonder how long this would last. If you think about it, I think I might just go crazy. Hyeni says food is always on his mind. Foreigners who don't speak Chinese at all, or the elderly, I think it would be difficult for them to join the group buying. Food distribution is completely left up to the residents themselves, so I think that's a problem. At the beginning of the lockdown, Hyeni would use various delivery apps for hours, day and night, clicking away in the hopes that one of the orders would come through. But once the citywide lockdown was announced, nothing ever came. Hyeni says he now eats less, so that what food he has will last longer. A former detainee at a Xinjiang region labor camp describes what he went through. He shared his experience at an event hosted by the Victims of Communism Memorial Foundation on Wednesday. Ovalbek Tordikun is a Christian originally from Kyrgyzstan, a Central Asian country bordering China's Xinjiang region. He says he was arrested in front of his family at his home in Xinjiang in 2018. Authorities showed up at 7 in the morning and took him away, first to a hospital for health checkups and then to a labor camp. <laughs> You have to accept uh, whatever crime they assign to you, and you need to be accept and be happy and just live there peacefully, quietly. And they did a, a court process for me as well. And it, it was only about three minutes. Tordikun says authorities at the labor camp didn't tell him how long they would keep him there. They do not say anything that how long you're going to be kept in that uh, place, and they just say that the Chinese party, the Communist Party, is, uh, is graceful, it's a good country, and you're just going to stay here, and they will never say how long I'm going to be here. 
Teutikun spent 10 months in the labor camp with more than 20 other inmates, living under harsh conditions. After his release, he fled with his family to Kyrgyzstan. Republican Congressman Chris Smith, who also spoke at the event, condemned the Chinese Communist regime's treatment of ethnic and religious minorities in Xinjiang. You know, at a time when we have uh, a genocide occurring in Ukraine uh, by Vladimir Putin, uh, we also have a genocide of horrific proportions occurring uh, in the People's Republic of China by Xi Jinping. It is all his genocide. Uh, he ordered it. He said, show no mercy. The Chinese regime has been mass detaining Uyghurs and other minorities in Xinjiang since at least 2017, accusing them of extremism. The U.S. State Department estimates that over one million have been put into detention camps. Former detainees report forced labor, systemic abuse, and forced sterilization. Video sharing app TikTok is raking in ad revenue. Reports say it's likely to triple in 2022 to more than $11 billion, more than Twitter and Snapchat combined. That's according to research firm Insider Intelligence. More than half of that revenue is expected to come from the United States, TikTok's largest market. The app has become a favorite for social media users, especially teens. But despite its popularity, the company isn't without controversy. For one, the app is owned by Chinese developer ByteDance. And under Chinese law, all domestic companies must hand over data to the Chinese communist regime if requested, meaning all private information that the app collects from users could be fed directly to Beijing. Casey Fleming is a cybersecurity expert and the CEO of Black Ops Partners. He told host Brendan Fallon from NTD's Wide Angle that the risk is real. We have to assume that these applications that we use on our phones, and namely the ones coming from China and Russia, are weaponized against us, our families, our companies, and the free world. TikTok also has been criticized for its lax action against harmful content. A series of teen deaths and injuries have been associated with suicide-related or other extreme content shared to TikTok. Before we close the show, we'd like to address a correction from our most recent episode. Russia hasn't been communist for several decades, a change marked by Gorbachev's resignation in 1991. We regret the error. That's all for today's China in Focus on YouTube. We're now sharing a shortened version of our program on YouTube. That's after being demonetized for a year. Full episodes can be watched on our partner platform, Epoch TV. To sign up for a 14-day free trial, please click the link down below. Thanks for watching China in Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer, and see you tomorrow. Every once in a while, something comes along so masterful, it leaves you in awe. So inspiring, it changes your life. So beautiful, you wish it would never end. When that happens, it's something not to be missed. Shen Yun, an all-new production every year. performance was enchanting. I feel better about the world. I feel uplifted. It touches you. It really does. The expertise of the dancers was really, really strong. To know that it was live music was really fantastic. We didn't want to miss this. Make sure you see it. Have to come. Life-changing.